All righty, I'd like to welcome everyone uh, that's tuning into our program, uh, whenever you may be. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gill. I am the Kansas Room Coordinator at the Hayes Public Library in Hayes, Kansas. Um, I oversee the Dorothy D. Richards Kansas Room, which is a local history and reference collection housed in the basement of the uh, Hayes Public Library. Today, I'm joined by a fascinating guest, uh, Hannes Zacharias, um, who now works at the University of Kansas. Uh, Hannes has uh, spent his entire life in Kansas, um, being born in Wichita, grew up in Dodge City, um, educated at Wichita State University. Um, he has spent his entire career in state and local government, and now, like I said, teaches at the University of Kansas. And I'm bringing Hannes here today to uh, be a part of our Crossroads Change in Rural America initiative, which is being brought to you by uh, the Humanities Kansas and the Smithsonian Institute. Um, this uh, program here is being uh, was sponsored by Humanities Kansas, so that's who's being, that's why is uh, possible today. Uh, Crossroads Change in Rural America is a nationwide initiative brought to you by the Smithsonian Institute and their Museum on Main Street program, and it's to uh, allow for rural uh, uh, rural America to kind of oversee their um, their place in in the future of this country. Um, it's to highlight uh, some changes, um, some, some success stories, and some challenges as we move forward. Um, right now, uh, the Hayes Public Library is hosting their own partner site um, that's been brought to you by Humanities Kansas. And our partner site is really kind of focusing on the major issue of water. Um, it doesn't matter where you live in Kansas, you kind of have a, a different um, idea of how we relate to the environmental impact of water, the economic impact of water. And so all of our programming, um, either online, in person, um, and our display is kind of dealing around that, uh, is kind of focused along that uh, topic. I'm bringing Hannes in today to talk about the Arkansas River. Um, Hannes has a very intimate relationship with the, with the river, and he's actually traveled it uh, two times, one being as recent as 2018, where he went uh, from the Continental Divide in Colorado, clear to the Gulf of, of Mexico. So he's going to give a little bit of the impact of this historical, uh, environmental, and a little bit of his own personal stories of this uh, this really uh, important in, uh, environmental uh, uh, river that's here in, in the state of Kansas, and how it kind of uh, how it, uh, different communities um, and their relationship with with the river itself. So I'll let Hannes go ahead and uh, start his uh, presentation. Well, thanks, Jeremy. I first want to say thank you very much for allowing me to go ahead and do this. And I have a long, a strong affinity for uh, Hayes America, as we call it out there. Uh, I was so blessed to go ahead and have 10 years of my life spent as city manager in Hayes and really relished every moment of it. And so it's nice to have back a connection with the Hayes Public Library in this great effort as well. So thank you. No um, problem. Appreciate that. The, I want to talk about, I've got several slides and some videos as well in it, but I want to tell your viewers that there's, there are two sections to this, uh, this video display. We're going to do about 45 minutes or so in this first section, then there's a second part, another 45 minutes. And during that time period, we'll cover the entire length of the Arkansas River from its headwaters at the Continental Divide, Tennessee Pass, all the way down to the Mississippi River. Um, so it kind of gives you a sense of, of bookends here. I'm going to share my screen and feel free to interrupt me, uh, Jeremy, as we go through. If you have questions or comments, and we might uh, end up maybe have a few questions at the end as well before we tie things up. But that's kind of the general bookends of this, this uh, two-part presentation. So I'll share my screen um, and uh, get started here. So this is what I call the Arkansas River, obviously, and I do call it the Arkansas versus the Arkansas because, hey, I'm from Kansas, so that's what we do. Uh, here's what I'm going to be, be covering, though, in these two sections. The first part is a general context to the history of the Arkansas River in broad brush. You can't do, but do a good service um, with just the time that we have, but give you snippets of that. The backdrop I'm going to do for this presentation are my two trips, one that I did in 1976 as a youngster of 22, uh, and in 2018, as a um, mature person um, over 65. Uh, and we'll cover this portion going from the headwaters to Deerfield, Kansas. And the second portion will cover all the way from Deerfield to the Mississippi River. 
I do first of all want to go ahead and give you my bona fides, if you will, some of my background about about not just this river, but other rivers I've done. I've been doing rivers for about 45 years. Started out as a Boy Scout in Dodge City, and we did a, a long trip uh, down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon, and that really got me hooked on uh, whitewater, although I'm not really a whitewater rafter, but waters in general. Uh, and I have done uh, the National Scenic Riverways, many of those in the central part of the country. I've done the Kansas River. Uh, I've done the Missouri River from Yankton, South Dakota to St. Louis, uh, Missouri, uh, you know, about 600 miles there. And of course, my two trips uh, in, in New Orleans. We, we go cattling on a regular basis. Uh, so I've got uh, thousands of miles under my keel, if you will, and many nights under uh, nylon, I was going to say canvas, uh, as, as we kind of traverse the, the river. So it kind of gives you some sense of my, of my background. I do want to talk about the, the 1976. I did do a trip from Dodd City, Kansas to New Orleans. I was carrying a bicentennial message from the mayor of, New, of Dodd City, the mayor of New Orleans. Um, and I got inspired to do that uh, trip by my dad. Um, it was, uh, you know, but it really kind of was a truncated trip from Dodge City to New Orleans. We did do it in 1976. It took me about uh, two and a half months. This is a picture of me leaving in Dodge City and kind of a uh, proof that I did that uh, on the river by having my tent there. The camping gear is very much the same I did back in 76 uh, compared to 2018. It's probably helpful to say why I did it uh, is my dad, being an immigrant from Germany, always had a desire to go from Dodd City to New York City visa water uh, and down all the way in Mississippi and around the, uh, uh, the peninsula of Florida and up the intercoastal waterway to New York City. Uh, that was a relatively long thing. He was an orthopedic surgeon in Dodd City and didn't have that much time, but he inspired me to go ahead and do it. We had the boat available and I was supposed to go ahead and kind of do that trip in his absence or with one of my buddies. Uh, when I, one of my buddies backed out, however, I decided to go ahead and do it anyway and did the, the trip uh, in 76 by myself. I had never been down south before, never been on the river that long before, never been by myself that long before. So it really was what I'd call a Mark Twain experience to go ahead and see the river from that point in time. Uh, the point being that there actually was water in the river at that, at that time. Uh, so I was able to float a lot of it, not much of it, uh, at least between Dodge City and Wichita. I had to get transported to Hutch and move on down from that point. But from Wichita on down, I was all self-sufficient as I went down to New Orleans. In fact, here I am in New Orleans uh, on the moon landings. Uh, no, I'm not Gulliver. The, it's just kind of an optical distortion of those people behind me. Uh, there's much smaller. Uh, but it gives you proof that indeed I did that trip. Um, I wish I was that thin now, but no. Um, and uh, I promised myself when I got done in 1976 that I wanted to do the trip again. Yeah, but I wanted to do it the entire length. Uh, and the entire length being uh, the entire trip starting at the Continental Divide and going down to the Gulf of Mexico. Because the area that is in between, uh, hopefully you can see my cursor, uh, from the uh, Tennessee Pass all the way to Dodd City here, I had not done. That's about 450 miles, nor had I done the portion from New Orleans down to the Gulf of Mexico, about another 100 miles. So I wanted to do the entire thing, uh, and I was telling my kids about it time after time after time. When I left Johnson County as county manager uh, in 2018, uh, the notion came up to me saying, well, either put up or shut up on us, either do the trip or don't do the trip. Uh, and you've been telling yourself for some, you know, 42 years to go ahead and do it. Now's the time to go ahead and do it. And so I did. Uh, so I did kind of uh, reconnoiter all the gear. I purchased a new kayak uh, that was big enough to go ahead and heavy, uh, you know, uh, call me as well as all my gear I needed uh, and set off to go ahead and do the second trip. Uh, down the way down to New Orleans. And this is me kind of doing a shakedown trip uh, out near Lawrence, uh, but ended up the entire trip over a hundred days, starting on Memorial Day and ending on uh, Labor Day uh, with my son there in New Orleans, kind of ending up the trip. It was a wonderful trip to go ahead and, and have that stuff, uh, have that memory and be able to put bookends on that trip. So that's the, the background I give you, that I can give you some sense of what it looked like uh, back in, uh, 2000, in, uh, in uh, 1976, I'm looking at my time here, uh, as well as um, what it looks like in 2018 uh, going forward here. So uh, with that, we're gonna concentrate though on the Arkansas River, which is a total amount of almost 1500 miles. 
from the Continental Divide all the way down to uh, where it crosses into uh, the Mississippi River. And actually, uh, the Arkansas River, uh, I went through the area of the White River where the port of Catoosa and what they call the McClellan Kerr Navigation System dumps in, but that's a later conversation. It looks like this in a little more detail here. Uh, it covers uh, many parts of the, of the Midwest, all the way from Pueblo through notable cities of Garden City, Dodge City, Great Bend, certainly Wichita and Hutchinson, Tulsa, Muskogee, Fort Smith, Little Rock before it dumps into uh, the Mississippi River. To give us some context, however, this, I think, Jeremy, for your, for your viewers, let's talk about some history about uh, the Arkansas River that may be, may be helpful. Um, uh, so let, let's, let's talk about the idea that the, this area was occupied for a long time by Native Americans. And that's one frustration for me about traveling this river is that I was unable to capture really the rich history that preceded the conquistadors pre-1500. Uh, because it's an oral history tradition. But I want to reinforce the fact that this that area had been occupied and the dark line you see here is the Arkansas River uh, that's overlaid um, on here. Um, from this point here, this is the Arkansas River. This is where it bends around all the way down. You can see the various tribes that were occupying it. Some migrated back and forth, but many, you know, the Quapaw, the Osage, the Kiowa, the Arapaho uh, were, were all big part of the environs of the Arkansas River. And they use it oftentimes as a line of demarcation between tribal territories uh, as much as they did. The history of the Arkansas River really gets more into, into focus though with the Coronado expedition back in the 1540s. Uh, and I remember growing up in Dodge City where we had Coronado's, uh, there's cross right in Dodge City where Coronado is supposed to have crossed over all the way up to Salina uh, and the location of what they thought was Quivira. Uh, so this portion of the Arkansas River was explored by Coronado back in those areas. And then of course that information uh, gets tied back and uh, then the kind of the more of the uh, migration of the Spanish uh, and other Europeans coming to the central part of the country kind of kicks off from that point. Um, I point out this kind of old map of what they thought. Uh, the, the next version of life really is the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, for those who, who have indeed have abstracts for their home ownership, you'll find out that page number one of your abstract is uh, the 1804 uh, Louisiana Purchase. And of course, this is the Arkansas River as well. For the area they thought was Louisiana Purchase, the area basically uh, the watershed of the, uh, of the Missouri River, of which the Arkansas River is a contributor from there. Here's what the map looks like for the uh, for Louisiana Purchase at, at that point in time. Uh, so you can see that that was a major part of and it dissects basically uh, the Louisiana Purchase. I might add that the Arkansas River for broad context is the sixth longest river in the world, the 45th longest river, uh, I'm sorry, sixth longest river in the country, the 45th longest river in the world. So it gives you some perspective. It's not a small lightweight river uh, even today in many respects. Um, back in, of course, the, the territories, Zebulon Pike then goes ahead after the Louisiana Purchase in 1806. Uh, he explores the area coming up the Missouri River, hitting the Osage River, and then crossing over into Kansas, goes all the way up to Pawnee Village, which you might be familiar from a historical perspective, then down through the cross the Smoky and where Great Bend is roughly, and then covers the entire length, the remaining length of the Arkansas River, all the way up pretty much to the headwaters, close to the headwaters, not totally, uh, but kind of looks basically, well, not even that far, basically Bent's Fort in that area near La Junta, then he heads south from that point. But another big part of the Arkansas River comes into play by virtue of, uh, of uh, the work of Zebulon Pike. I've had a chance to read some of his journals, fascinating material and information about how the, how, how the expedition was fed and a lot of great details there I can talk about later on. Of course, the Louisiana Purchase was not, uh, there was a lot of debate and uh, about where the boundaries were of the Louisiana Purchase. And I point this out because in 1819, uh, then the, the treaties with Spain, uh, instead of making the original version of Louisiana Purchase, you can see along here as far as the watershed, it gets migrated to the Red River and then it hits the 100th, per, 100th parallel, 100th meridian, I should say up to the Arkansas River, and then Arkansas River all to the headwaters becomes the boundary then for between uh, Texas and, and Mexico and Spain and Louisiana Purchase. I say that because that's exactly where Dodge City is and how Dodge City got founded. In fact, there is a boulder that talks about the 100th Meridian on the Arkansas River, and there's a lot of markers that talk about that. So for a good time, 
North of the Arkansas River was the United States, south side was Spain, Texas, and all those activities. The big event obviously happened in, in my view of the, this part that really kind of puts luster uh, to the Arkansas River is the uh, Santa Fe Trail, which comes into play in 1821. And of course, this is the uh, start of that and goes all the way from Franklin, Missouri, all the way down to Santa Fe. Uh, my wife and I just recently did the 200th, uh, the 200th, the 200th anniversary celebration by uh, driving the entire length and kind of uh, capturing the uh, the boulders, historical boulders, the first one starting in downtown Overland Park, at least for the Daughters of the American Re Revolution, uh, and then all the way down to Santa Fe, the last one. So it was fun to kind of see and recreate that. But certainly that kicked off a lot of information about, about this trade route. We know it was a trade route. It really was not a route for migration, but they used the river as a way for water source, but also was a barrier and was difficult to cross, which gives you a sense of how uh, important it was and, and how robust it was as a waterway to kind of work, work through. Of course, the areas then gets divided up with regards to the Indian migrations back in 1836. And you can see this just talks about how Kansas was sliced up between the various parts of, of, of Indian territory. And then of course, in 1854, Kansas gets divided up uh, with, the, with the territory going all the way to the Continental Divide uh, and then getting shrunk back as far as, far as well. I point that out to tell you that the Arkansas River has had a great connection to the history of Kansas and has been a formidable waterway, both in terms of water purveyance as well as lines of demarcation between territory. And we'll find out later on the second part, really for transportation purposes as well. Let's talk about the hydrology a little bit about the Arkansas River. And I think this is really important. Uh, Jeremy, you and I have talked about this, that really this is, there are, it's two rivers in my viewpoint, primarily because of this chart, which is the main annual mean precipitation in the United States. And you can see that this area here, the green portions uh, have a good deal of precipitation. Well, you know, 30 uh, inches or more coming in this area. And just to the west of that area is around 16 inches or 14 inches of rainfall a year. So you can basically draw a line around the entire part of the country that goes north to south, dissecting the country. West of this area is very dry and water rights are very well shot over uh, in terms of water supply and uh, uh, providing for, for irrigation and for livestock and for people. And east of this, water becomes much more of a nuisance in terms of trying to go ahead and get rid of it in, in terms of, of, uh, of flooding controls and becomes a, a way to go ahead and, and provide conveyance for barge traffic, et cetera. And the Arkansas River dissects this. So it really is two rivers uh, in, 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 in my view that are dramatically different from one another and you'll see why. The other thing that's really important to understand, now you understand this blue line in, in context here, uh, and we talk about it in Kansas all the time, west of 81 and east of 81, primarily, if you're a Kansan, you know what that means. Uh, it's because, because of that rainfall. The second thing really is the understanding the beginnings of the High Plains Ogallala Aquifer. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm so proud of Hayes and, and the Sternberg Museum because it really reinforces the understanding uh, that the, uh, the, the, um, the, the fossils that existed there, that exist underneath in that area came from the inland seas. And if you've not seen the Turnberg Museum, please do so. But that provided the water, which really provides for the Ogallala Aquifer, which then has been used for water mining for years for irrigation. Uh, and you can see that the Ogallala Aquifer has this kind of that lips of, of saturated thicknesses uh, stretching all the way from South Dakota all the way down to Texas of which Kansas is a big part of that. And we'll talk more about that, but it gives you a sense of the hydrology as well. So you can't talk about the river without talking about rainfall, and you can't talk about the river without talking about the Oglala Aquifer and how, the impact it's had on it. So uh, let me pause there and see if you have any questions here, Jimmy, before I move on and talk about kind of the transfer, going the river from the headwaters, but I'll stop there and see if you have any questions. Sure. Um, I don't really have any questions for you, Hannes, but uh, just kind of a, a note, um, <laughs> well, I guess we'll get into it a little bit uh, later, but as you personally in your own life have seen uh, growing up in Dodge City to living in Johnson County, you can really get that understanding of that divided of not just only uh, geographically, but within the river itself. I mean, I know the Arkansas doesn't go to Johnson County where you live now, um, but none understanding, uh, you know, that that concept of almost too much water in one part of the state. Uh, getting the majority of your uh, drinking water and all that from surface water um, to a uh, heavy irrigation in the West. And, and that's definitely become much more dramatic 
um, in 2020 or 2021, sorry, um, today and it will continue for the future as well. Well, you're right. And I think that I've been, again, fortunate, uh, the conversation to live in both so sectors. Growing up in Dodge City, and I remember back in 1961, uh, when indeed the floods occurred there, and I remember much of downtown Dodge City being underwater to today where there's no river at all. Uh, con contrast that with the junction, uh, Johnson County, which really has no strong connection to Western Kansas for water because the water comes out of the Missouri and it's water aplenty. And the issue becomes really stormwater mitigation and how to go ahead and take care of flooding. You're exactly right. And so that gives me, I guess, a perspective that trying to keep those two rivers, those two states in mind from my viewpoint. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I really think that um, this is important to the conversation that we're having today and, and, and part of this Crossroads project is that this is going to continue to be a major issue um, for a lot of rural uh, Americans, um, not only in Kansas, but in the Western half of the United States, um, whether it's the Arkansas River or um, the Colorado River or you know every place basically in the West as, as we move forward and um, more people are living more densely or we're using it for more uh, ag purposes and also climate change is affecting that. So. I, I think that's really important to drive home that you know several communities um, are are dealing with this and and will continue to do so. Well, exactly, and Hayes has been at the epicenter of a lot of those conversations as far as the in, in Kansas is concerned, right? So let me go ahead and keep on going and, and talk about. Um, please interrupt me as you as you feel yeah. motivated here as we go through. The next part of the the. the presentation, I'll use that, is talking about the area from Tennessee Pass to Canyon City. And I'm going to break this up uh, so you can kind of give some context to it. So this is the map area, the red line, talks about really this 175 mile area from Leadville or above Leadville all the way down to Canyon City, close to Pueblo, uh, and make some comments that way. As I talked about in 2018, I did start out uh, and I wanted to follow a drop of water from the Continental Divide to the Gulf of Mexico. So here I am gathering water at Tennessee Pass to, to go and be able to do that. And I did went above Turquoise Reservoir as well and gather water because the vision I had really was to go ahead and pour water, if you will, from the Continental Divide down to the Gulf of Mexico and say I transported that water which you'll see later on in the presentation is impossible because the water is all whisked away by the time it gets to Deerfield and Garden City. Uh, you can't talk about uh, the Warkins River without talking about the, some of the historical locations, one of which is Leadville. Leadville is the very top of the, of the Arkansas River uh, Basin area. Um, and of course, in the 1880s, it was a huge area for uh, somewhat gold mining, but really transferred quickly to silver mining. And now it really is the home of molybdenum mining and the Climax mine there. I point this out because the, uh, the, you can see that uh, it was a boom and bust town. Uh, it really was a situation where they were mining that resources to all, all its get out and then leaving. Uh, leaving basically the traces of that behind to the point where now, uh, at least from the 1950s and 60s, the molybdenum mine activity, the extracts, the tailings of that were contaminating the river to such a large extent, it was a river you didn't want to be around. Uh, and the Arkansas River was really was very putrid uh, and, um, uh, and polluted. Uh, of course, the EPA coming in in the 1970s changes the face of that, which has dramatic positive implications for that region. Uh, so Leadville's historic community right next to Leadville is uh, the beginnings of uh, now water conveyance. We know that water has, once it, the Arkansas River is basically all the way down to Wichita is, uh, is every drop is accounted for and is put to some sort of beneficial use. A big part of that use though comes across from the Continental Divide uh, through what's called the Frying Pan uh, River or I guess Navigation Arkansas River Project which harvests water along the Frying Pran River and actually tunnels it underneath the Continental Divide through the Bowstead Tunnel and puts it into Turquoise Reservoir, uh, which then gets conveyed all the way down to and, and all the way down then into Pueblo Reservoir. A whole network of, of tunnels then also go out to go ahead and take the water at various locations to then give water to um, um, Colorado Springs and areas in the southern part of Denver. So uh, the water is used to great beneficial use as far as that's concerned. This is what it looks like coming out of Turquoise Reservoir or coming out of the Bowstead Tunnel and filling up Turquoise Reservoir. Headwaters of the Arkansas River. Flowing down into Turquoise Lake. where 
starts. So that's where I started the kind of the trip and going across Turquoise Reservoir. Uh, going on further down, the river now starts becoming coming out of Turquoise Reservoir becomes really a torrent pretty quickly. And uh, back in 2018, uh, my desire when I was going through this area was to avoid injury or death. Uh, so I did commercial river operators as well, but it gets very treacherous pretty quickly. Railroad bridge on the Arkansas River looking upstream. You'll see a picture in just a second, but then you get to the area really kind of, as I'd said before, Leadville created such a polluting environment that the river itself was viewed as a real eyesore and a nuisance, uh, so much so that cities along the area, Salida and so forth, Buena Vista, uh, back in the 50s and 60s, built large concrete walls to shepherd and shield themselves away from the river. The EPA comes in, starts cleaning up the river, and back in the 1970s, then you see people that really believe that this be, is a beneficial use and start bringing in to traverse this area, uh, changing the economy of the area all the way from uh, basically uh, Leadville all the way down to uh, to Pueblo Reservoir, at least to the other side of of the uh, uh, of, of the Royal Gorge, coming through that area. Um, so much traffic was going on by virtue of Norwegians and East and Europeans coming in to do it that conflicts arose between the landowners and those who are kayakers and then trout fishermen as well. Uh, that there are many uh, fist fights and altercations and some gunplay as well. That the community decided then to go and create the Arkansas Headwaters. It collects resources and money from outfitters to go ahead and provide funding for, to put in uh, other access points and change the economy of really what was a depressed area. This area was the uh, fruit basket, the vegetable basket for uh, this part of Colorado and for the Denver area until uh, irrigation comes into play in large measure just in, in Southern California, then this area becomes depressed. Now the area really rides on the billion, over billion dollar industry for rafters uh, and for uh, gold medal trout fishing individuals. Um, that uh, that that is the primary source of income uh, right now in the area. To much so that Salida now is so expensive that those who are working in the restaurants and so forth can't afford to live there. Uh, so it really has transformed the the uh, the area uh, by virtue of recreation because the river is a positive viewpoint uh, coming out from that point. You can see the areas of Salida takes great advantage uh, of, of the river opportunities. You can see that this actually was the area where the, where the wall was previously visualized a six foot wall that indeed uh, was a way to kind of shelter them from this what well, at that point in time polluted river. Um, it is now the largest uh, number of rafters in the world go through this 150 mile area. Uh, which is just phenomenal to see how see where it was just 40, 50 years ago. Rafting goes through, I'd, I'd go through as well. And this is the area just starting into uh, the Royal Gorge. If you ever get a chance to do the rafting, I think you should do that. Um, go with a professional guide, don't go by yourself. Uh, the people do get injured and killed in this area, but I wanted to have that experience and did, did have the experience. What a beautiful vista going through the Royal Gorge, thousands of feet up to the, uh, to the suspension bridge, uh, just wonderful and beautiful. Uh, and of course, along the banks, you see the three different railroads that were actually cut into the side of the river uh, to go all the way up to Leadfield to get the mining. So that's part of the story as well. Below that area, then you get into uh, beginning the area going into Pueblo Reservoir. The river changes dramatically, becomes a prairie river, one that is most accustomed to us in Western Kansas uh, going forward. Very placid and very, very uh, navigable. Nice flowing river, good flow, a few rapids, but not many very doable uh, for any kayaker or canoeist. So that kind of gets you down to that point of, of to Canyon City. Let's now go from Pueblo Reservoir to Deerfield and kind of finish out, at least talk about this next section. That's the section you see in red here. Several hundred miles going through Eastern Colorado and the beginnings parts of Western Canyon.
so sorry for that glitch here. Uh, we'll keep on going. But this, the 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 flooding issues uh, with many people getting killed in Pueblo then required the community to go ahead and uh, finance uh, with other resources a reservoir that gets managed again every drop going to Colorado uh, Springs and areas of Denver and so forth. The river though changes its character. It looks now like this becomes in Pueblo uh, a. Uh, uh, a really kind of a storm water area, if you will. And there's too many uh, rapids here, I guess, too many uh, obstructions for me to go ahead and paddle through this area, although I tried. But if you go to uh, Pueblo right now, you'll see this area, uh, which is what they call the Riverwalk area. It is a man-made area, a uh, very nice kind of inland lake that gives the appearance of the river, but it's not the river. Uh, I'm happy that indeed they're doing that, but this is not where they are. I put Charles Goodnight in here because they are refurbishing Charles Goodnight's uh, original uh, cabin. Uh, of course, Charles Goodnight was one of the, one of the first phones to actually uh, do a uh, cattle drive uh, from Texas up to the railheads. Uh, he is also the one that coined the term chuck wagon. That's where it comes from. Uh, so a little tidbits here as we go along. Heading further to the east, uh, it becomes a river that is uh, shallow, but has, has abilities here going forward. Uh, you can actually travel it at certain times. I, I will tell you that Colorado's water uh, regulations indicates that you cannot camp on the side of the river. Almost every place else from Kansas on down, canoeists and kayakers are, are able to go ahead and uh, contact the river up to the high water mark. In Colorado, it's different. Uh, all the land becomes to the landowner, including the bottom of the river. So if you touch the bottom of the river without having uh, rights uh, or permission from the landowner, you're basically trespassing. So I'm trespassing at this point because my kayak is the dropping is, is not is in contact with the with the soil, uh, which makes traveling this area very difficult. In fact, some cases um, you have landowners that put barbed wire across uh, the uh, the river uh, as well as electrified wires. Uh, and when there's flow, you can get easily seriously guillotined. So I had to go ahead and work very heavily to go and make sure I avoided the, avoid those those issues. So the dragging begins. There's water, but not really enough water to float in. So be it. So it gives you a sense the water looks different, but where there's water, there is life. And there is water around a good portion of it. Uh, in fact, water gets, you know, then starts getting divided out into ditch irrigation system. And this is a diversion dam. They're very scary to approach on the river because you can hear them before you can see them. And when you can see them, you really don't have an idea how to get around them because it's not designed for canoeists or kayakers. Um, uh, it's very treacherous if you try to go over them, can be killed rather easily. So this is the dam I had to portage around today. Water diversion structure, but have done so safely and successfully. Now this is a nice video. The actually uh, the uh, earlier in the day I had come up in kind of one of these uh, these uh, uh, dams. I went to one side; it was impassable. I went to the other side, back up river, and there was a large steep bank about 20 feet, but about a 45 degree ankle. I pulled my kayak up, and my paddle goes out of the boat and goes over the dam. Oh, great! But me being a Boy Scout, I have a second paddle. That's fine. I avoid the Doberman pinchers that are guarding the area and get back in the boat. I see then below the river, looking up river, I see well, there's my paddle stuck right behind a stump, but the stump is right below the toe of the dam, probably in this area. So I said, what the heck, I'll go up and retrieve my, my uh, paddle. I get up that location every time I get close to it and push down it, it goes further down the water, further down the water, further down the water. And after about 50, 20 minutes, I say, I'm not gonna die here at the toe of the, band, uh, the, of the dam trying to go ahead and save a $75 paddle. Uh, which is one of the things I learned compared to 1976, compared to 2018, to not make stupid mistakes and be able to live the, live the tale of tale. Uh, so I had much more colorful language for that part of the video, but it's not it's not fit for family consumption. <laughs> So moving on down here, you, Rocky Ford is part of the area and they're bringing that community back. But the, the historically, the river had all, has always had uh, a, a problem with regards to pollution, high, high uh, uh, chemical content, content that it was not suitable for much of the irrigation activity, except for melons and for sugar beets. Uh, so back uh, in the day, the 1930s and so forth, melons and sugar beets were very, very strong. Uh, Holly, Colorado was very known for that. And of course, the epicenter for, for melons and so forth is Rocky Ford. It was kind of the epicenter for all that activity. 
Um, and now because the sugar beets are now being, are being grown across the world and marketed that way, they've lost the sugar beet market. Uh, but that was a big part of that part of Eastern Colorado was the water coming from Arkansas River to provide ditch irrigation for melons and for sugar beets. And Hannes, if you don't mind me uh, jumping in here, I have to uh, plug my own family's lineage is that I'm actually related to uh, George Washington Swink, uh, who uh, for people in that neck of the woods know that there is a Swink Colorado near Rocky Ford named after George Washington Swink, um, who uh, moved out to Colorado and kind of pioneered that area. Um, he actually held the first timber claim um, in, in the area and he, was the one that uh, crossbred and made the Rocky Ford cantaloupe, cantaloupe which completely transformed that uh, area into an agricultural powerhouse um, at the time. And it was all done through that uh, Arkansas uh, uh, River diversion uh, method, which obviously has a major environmental impact, but it really had that economic boom in that area. So it was always kind of nice to uh, kind of be related to someone that you can you can throw a personal touch on. So my uh, my grandmother's uh, maiden name is Swink. Uh, so it's it's kind of a it's kind of a, a kind of a random uh, uh, person to be related to, but definitely important in uh, southeastern Colorado. Absolutely, and thanks for bringing that up because it was an it's very noteworthy. And uh, there's also the town of Swink just outside of Rocky Ford. Absolutely, and he was a major player in that whole area and how to go ahead and convey and really watering the valley, if you will. We've re we've read some books to that that regard. Uh, I had I had uh, you and I had talked about that before, but thank you for bringing that up. Marvelous. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So also in the area, it's all of this going to obviously sequence to a degree is, is La Junta uh, with regards to Bent's Fort. And historically, it really wasn't a fort per se. It was a trading facility where uh, folks from all across the, we have voyagers coming down from Canada. You have uh, Spanish uh, uh, merchantmen coming in as well. Folks from the East Coast all conveying here to go ahead and trade uh, and uh, convey different goods. It was a major uh, port, if you will, a stopping point on the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, this is um, there, and you can actually tour this facility. They've rebuilt it, uh, and they actually have it's a national historic site. Also, terrific uh, area to go on a tour and understand more of the history of the Santa Fe Trail and the importance again of the river. It's right on the river as well. The lower right-hand corner really is uh, the Kashari Indian Kiva. If you've not seen them, Kashari Indians, uh, the scout troop does a lot of Native American uh, dances. One of the largest kivas uh, in uh, in that part of the country. Uh, and they have permission from Native Americans to do that, but very strong history. Further on down, uh, you get to the areas around Bent's new fort. This was Bent's old fort, uh, just above John Martin Reservoir. Uh, and this is where uh, basically uh, the uh, soldiers mustered up to go ahead and do the infamous, I'll say that term, Sand Hill Massacre later on some hundred miles north of there. Uh, this is where they, they marketed. The fort has now been dis dissolved. Uh, but you can be in that area, you can see kind of what it was back in 1866 and what it looks like currently. Just below this is a very kind of, uh, you can see this outcropping of rocks here. Uh, and it was a very known worthy uh, location, the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, gives you a sense of, here give you a sense of the, uh, what it looks from the river. So portaging around the uh, remains of New Bents with New Fort and Fort Lyon. Original Fort Lyon. These uh, outcroppings here were well known to those in the Santa Fe Trail and Native Americans. So Mr. Bent, after the first fort burned down, decided to relocate it here. It's now a site of one of the diversion dams. There are carvings and uh, people's signatures from the Santa Fe Trail days. On these rocks. So you can kind of see this, this is one of the diversion dams from the upstream side and going down over the portions here, you can see this, the headwater of the dam before it spills over. So historical significance and also the, the current hydrological significance of the ditch irrigation systems. I bring this graphic up to let you know that this, just to remind you that uh, the groundwater information and, and about the uh, cones of depression at the recharge information, creating the water table, that then you can go ahead and access the water table by virtue of, of irrigation pumps that pump the water out uh, and then kind of then come back into the recharging of the, uh, of the rivers themselves, uh, which really becomes a significant factor as we go further east beyond Deerfield and the Arkansas River and its connection or lack thereof now with the Oglala Aquifer. 
Um, so it gives you kind of a sense of, you know, the hydrology and the, the amount of recharge or lack thereof to go ahead and replace the water being pulled out of pumps for irrigation and groundwater withdrawal. This is a diagram of the number of ditch irrigation systems that go from Pueblo Reservoir to John Martin Reservoir that have been started basically since the 1850s and are still in place now. And it gives you a diagram that they, they, they will pull out water, let's say the Hampt Bell ditch, pulls out water, conveys it along an area here for distribution. It goes down further to the fields, collects stuff and goes back into this particular river and then comes back in the river. So it's a breathing mechanism. It comes back out, goes back in, comes back out, goes back in and during its process, it picks up all these dissolved solids into the river itself that when it gets into John Ratton Reservoir and actually the, the Kansas, Arkansas, Kansas Colorado border, it is a very polluted stream uh, today, uh, much more so than it was during the day when the Swink family is trying to use it for irrigation purposes, which I find is a real travesty from my viewpoint, but, but there it is. Um, to, to drive home the point about how much water gets uh, diverted for ditch irrigation activities, and this was stunning to me, um, as I said before, when I grew up in the, on the, in Dodge City, it was a river that indeed most of the time flowed and occasionally did not, uh, which now is a river that hardly ever flows and sometimes does during rain events because of this phenomenon. The video, audio is a little bit garbled because of the wind, but you'll get the point. So again, this is the place where the Arkansas River comes in and gets divided between the ditch irrigation systems in the Arkansas River. So I'll show you, this is the inflow of the river. This is the Rocky Ford Ditch Irrigation Diversion Dam. As I swing around, you'll see the remnants of the river after the water is taken. And you can see the river is virtually non-existent. It's a dry bed. Keep on swinging around and you can see there's where all the water is in the ditch irrigation system, virtually brimful. Very interesting. So as you can see, Jeremy, this now becomes private property. So now it's all private property. I can't paddle on it, can't touch it and those sort of things without being shot, which sometimes people are literally. Um, and I understand that water should be used, maybe the Arkansas River should be used 50% for irrigation, maybe 60, 75, maybe even 90%, but not 100% in my viewpoint. Uh, and this is where it reinforced for me that people care a great deal about the water the Arkansas River brings, but nobody cares about the Arkansas River. Broke my heart, to be honest about it. And this is a this is a video that really kind of solidifies to me, I think, the uh, the travesty that we've done, in my viewpoint, uh, for this used to be navigable, wonderful river, at least available river, uh, to now a dry stream bed. We'll talk more about that later on. Water does come back, and as I said before, into tail pits, and it gets into John Martin Reservoir. I show this picture for you, the downstream John part uh, part of John Martin Reservoir, because when I was there, there was no water coming out. Uh, in the evening, I then wake up in the morning and I see water flowing out, literally, I, I call the water um, I, um, water police, I guess the, uh, uh, the engineers, and they said, yeah, Kansas just called for his portion of water last night, so we've got to go and let water out. And so I rode the wave, literally, uh, going across the Kansas border. And when there's water, it's beautiful. There's lots of stuff going on, and so I, I was fortunate to go and ride that wave. You can see uh, a lot of the, uh, the salt cedars, which I think are the bane for some farmers and so forth, but the blossoms are out. There's a lot of, of vegetation. There's a lot of wildlife. There are fish available during that time areas as well. People come out and they recreate in the property. Uh, either they kind of, you know, they, the water's up, get your inner tubes out and start recreating in the water because it's not going to be there in the future. But there are also areas where people are trying to destroy the vegetation because they want to keep the water uh, uh, basically in the creek to be uh, siphoned off later on for irrigation, either ditch or uh, sprinkler irrigation. This is what it looks like. So I don't know exactly what's going on here, but this is about a half a mile to the west of the Kansas border on the north side of the river. And as you can see, it's just totally defoliated. Everything has dead. And I just don't understand how or why. So that's part of the dynamic of the river as well. People use it for their own purposes. 
uh, and destroy the vegetation as they see appropriate, which I find very disturbing. Uh, how bad is the water in terms of the of its of its uh, toxicity? Well, so much so that these are the cities that would use water along the way uh, to go ahead and find, get the water for their communities, Rocky Ford, La Hunta, Los Animas, Lamar. Well, they're all many together to go and do what's called the big conduit, to actually go ahead and build a huge pipeline, which will take out water at the uh, at Pueblo Reservoir early, so it won't get so polluted by virtue of all the ditch irrigation activities. There's also a good amount of radiation in the water as well going through the soil. Uh, so that gives you a sense of how bad water quality is in this part of eastern Colorado to have communities kind of decide to go ahead and build a different method of conveyance, conveyance that they don't have to rely upon the river itself. Working across going from uh, crossing the border, uh, this is just a, a, out near uh, Coolidge. Uh, this is the the gauge that's in the river talking about how many cubic feet per second should come out and they work it exactly correctly. I think it's around 650 gallons per uh, cubic feet per second passing by is what Kansas requires. Uh, and the uh, and it works well when indeed there's there's water available. Uh, you can see it looks beautiful that way. There's some illegal, I think, pumping from the area as well, kind of temporary sources, uh, but it's hard to go and, and police that area as we go through. During my trip as an aside issue, uh, people would ask me, well, do you wanna go ahead and do X? And at this point in time near Lincoln, and Lincoln, an individual said, hey, have you ever ridden water in the river? Cause the river's up today. And I said, uh, no, he says, would you like to do it? And my answer was always on this trip, yes. So I got a, I got a chance to go and ride a horse in the river, which was great fun. Uh, in fact, it was so deep in some places the horse was swimming. So, me being a Dodge yep. City boy, uh, I, I, I could relive my, my gun smoke days by having that happen. Um, once it reaches across the border, it's not like Colorado is all bad and Kansas is all good, if you'll use those terms. Kansas has its share of ditch irrigation systems as well. This is a map of the ditch irrigation systems coming out from both Colorado and in Kansas, but a good portion of that gets taken off what's called the farmer's ditch. Uh, and that's where Deerfield comes into play. So the last slide for this section of, of, our, of the program really talks about the diversion away from uh, the uh, ditch irrigation, the farmer's ditch out in Deerfield, Kansas. You can see again, 100% of the water gets diverted away and no water goes down the river. Um, so I'm gonna pause there uh, and say thank you for this portion, uh, Jeremy, and uh, have you ask me any questions or make any comments before we uh, stop here and take section two. I'm gonna stop sharing. No, I don't think there were anything uh, else going uh, question wise. Um, kind of a couple notes is, is just it, one, you're doing a great job because this is absolutely fascinating on how you did this. I am curious, like, did you kind of on just a personal level, did you have any kind of uh, um, homework before you ever started this trip in the sense of like, you know, you were talking about like kind of knowing when to jump off the river, knowing what to look for in the sense of like uh, barbed wire, um, you know, getting going down those uh, those dams or anything like that. Did you kind of know that that was going to happen? You, has that been written that you're like, okay, uh, this is what I need to be looking out for? A lot of homework beforehand, yes. Uh, these, these trips require a great deal of planning. I drove every crossing from um, Fort Smith all the way to Colorado on the Arkansas River because I wanted to see where it was. I went chose Fort Smith because beyond that point you're on navigable river riverways anyway. because so I wanted to see where I could pass and where I couldn't pass. Uh, so I did it all the way from Leadville down. The second thing is I scoured every map I could, and there is some great uh, uh, you know difference now than it was back in 2000, uh, 1976. Is satellite imaging, and so I went on websites, one of which is called Cal Topo. Uh, University of California has a very has a very robust mapping system that you can kind of make look at maps. So I try to find out where the um, uh, the low water dams were. Um, I also took some a software to go ahead and figure out that I could see where the property owners were along the way and try to contact them in Colorado. Because like I said, seriously, uh, they would put uh, barbed wire over and electrified wire. Uh, and every day I would try to find where I could get, could, was there water on my next section? And is there, are there obstructions I can get around and then try to park my vehicle downstream and then get a ride upstream to where my kayak was and float down to it and did that every day, kind of a hopscotch kind of sag wagon approach where I could, where there's no water at all, there was no point to go ahead and drag my canoe and just kind of put it on a dolly and hike it down for 10 miles. Why do that? Right. So yeah, a lot of homework. 
uh, to understand the laws. And I, I did a lot of, uh, I wanted to explore the river in terms of its contact with the cities and the communities. I had the, uh, since I'm in local government, I uh, gave me some context and enthusiasm to visit with city managers and county managers and elected officials along the entire route to say, how do they interact with the river? What's their viewpoint of the river? What's the long-term future of the river? Uh, so I could kind of get that in my brain as well. So a lot of homework. Great. And did you run into any like problems with people? I mean, were there people, you know, saying like, get out of here? Um, you know, what are you doing? What the heck are you doing? <laughs> and especially I, you, were, you were talking about mentioning that in Colorado that, you know, you can't just jump off whenever you feel like it either. So like, what was kind of that challenge as well? Well, it, I tried to avoid those conflicts wherever I could and try to be a good neighbor, first of all, not try to have trash and those sort of things, et cetera. I chose campsites that were not on the river. They were kind of a county or city owned campsites. So I would you know, take my vehicle and as, in the evening, I'd go drive to a campsite and then come back the next day to the location and continue to go on. So I didn't have that conflict. I tried to contact property owners along the way where I thought there might be a conflict and say, I'm doing this, this area. I just want to make sure let you know what's going on. And they're all very, very nice if you contact them in advance. What you can't do is just kind of uh, you know, violate their, their private property rights. You've got to communicate mm -hmm. with them and talk to them, at least in Colorado. And I try to do that as much as I possibly could. Yeah. And then did you ever run into any other uh, kayakers? Not in this portion, no. I, I did run into kayakers on the Mississippi, uh, but not on the Arkansas. Uh, no. Uh, well, I take that back. Uh, Arkansas and uh, around the Arkansas City, which we'll get to in the next segment here, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the areas uh, starting from Hutchinson on down, uh, people are using the, water, the uh, river with great aplomb uh, for recreation and fishing and so forth because it exists. Mm -hmm. uh, it really doesn't exist that much in, in Western Colorado and, and I'm sorry, Eastern Colorado and Southwest Kansas. Fantastic. All right. Well, I guess we'll wrap up this section and then uh, we'll kind of, uh, we'll start there our next one. So exactly right. Come back and stay tuned for part two. All righty.